Hello everyone, Snickety here, and welcome to Obscure PS2 Games, the series where we delve into lesser known, but no less interesting titles that you may not have played. Let's jump straight into it. Maze Action is like some programmer's first attempt at a video game that D3 decided to publish for some reason. Its rudimentary nature makes the rest of the simple 2000s back catalogue look like Final Fantasy X in comparison. It's such a bizarre, cheapo game that I'm shocked it managed to receive a PAL release by Agetech. So what is Maze Action, aside from action of the maze variety? You may choose one of the four playable characters taking part in the Hero Academy's final exam, which involves defeating everyone else in a deadly game of Super Pac-Man. The win condition is very simple. Leave from either the blue or red exit after collecting three keys of the corresponding colour. You start with a key and can steal one from your opponent by doing damage to them or luring them into a trap. The very first thing you'll notice while playing, or just watching this footage, is how slow and clunky your character moves. These are some of the worst tank controls I have ever seen. There's a really pitiful sidestep and jump button that's too slow and unresponsive to make use of most of the time. Playing this game is to make peace with the fact that you're dealing with some of the worst gameplay that has ever been devised. And no, I am not playing this in two-player. You always see your opponent's screen even in the story mode. It's kind of funny because you can use it to cheat, and you should because the AI is an absolute cheater as well. All of the guns are completely ineffective against an AI opponent. They will always dodge underneath your shots without fail, even if they're not looking in your direction. Maybe they're also cheating by looking at your screen. But the point is, the AI has a huge advantage over you in any firefight. Melee is a bit more doable, but does this really look like the kind of gameplay where you want to be getting into fights? Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. Lucky for you, you don't need to engage in combat at all to win most of the time. There's a foolproof strategy that you can use that will allow you to easily clear the story mode. First, collect two of the red keys you need scattered about the stage. Then make your way over to the red teleporter. It's where your opponent entered the stage from. Then drop the blue key you started with near the red teleporter. Your opponent will come by to pick it up and drop the last red key you need in the process. He may have all the blue keys now, but he needs to run all the way back to the other side of the map to win, while we're already close to the red teleporter. The AI falls for this every single time, because they're really stupid. Only the final boss seems to be wise to this trick, as you wouldn't stop harassing me despite having plenty of opportunities to trade the red key for the blue one and leave. I had to actually make her drop it with a trap this one time. Still though, if you hover around the red teleporter, you have a huge advantage. The final boss turns out to be the master in disguise, by the way. I don't know why she felt the need to disguise herself as a fat guy in a Hawaiian shirt, or why it was necessary to disguise herself at all, for that matter. I feel like there's some missing context here that's detailed in the manual that I don't have. What is the deep lore behind May's action, I simply must know. The fourth stage in the story mode is always a mirror match. This game doesn't have many characters to choose from. Also, this reminds me of the Devi Yuga. Your reward for beating the game is a new outfit, usually a skimpy fanservice-y one. It's a D3 game after all. They know what the drunk salarymen want to see. There's a free battle mode where you're able to set up custom battles with surprisingly large mazes. I imagine this is an absolute laugh riot if you're able to convince another person to play this with you in multiplayer. Surely they can't be immune to every gun in the game. The gameplay is bad, I think that much is evident. Even the menus for selecting your weapons and items is needlessly convoluted as well. There's weapon select, item select, and key select. You cycle through these with triangle and cycle through the items in those menus with the shoulder buttons. It's not very intuitive at all. There's also a green stamina bar below your health that depletes whenever you do anything. What is this, Dark Souls? If it gets too low, your character will be too exhausted to move around anymore and will have to rest for a bit. It really makes you think hard about your next action. It makes things so much more tense and strategic, you know? Except, not really, because you can just pause the game and let it recharge. 
Yes, really, and it only works for you and not your opponent. Is this a glitch, or did they intentionally put this in here? It's hard to say. I doubt anyone's playing this nowadays without knowing exactly what they're getting into. It's a horrible game, but at least it's funny about it. There's nothing wrong with a bit of maze action every now and then, it's good for you. Do you remember love? Rhetorical question, of course, how could you forget when such good Macross games exist to remind us? Yeah, I, I couldn't really think of a good way to introduce this one. It's Super Dimension Fortress Macross, developed by Sega AM2, of all people. I typically associate these guys with Bangor arcade games, but apparently this one time they decided to make a mecha game based on the classic anime and movie. Like all Macross games, it never saw a release outside of Japan, probably thanks to Harmony Gold being huge copyright trolls as usual. They've been milking that Robotech nostalgia for decades now, it's time to give it up. It's relatively import friendly though, aside from a few things that you might get stuck on. Like in Mission 2, where you're supposed to land on the SDF-1 before the timer runs out. Or in Mission 7, where you're supposed to free the cat's eye with guns rather than missiles. Actually, that one's just common sense now that I think about it. Otherwise, this is a fun, arcadey game that's pretty self-explanatory. Provided you're able to wrap your head around controlling a mecha that's able to transform into a jet and a strange middle ground between the two called Gerwalk Mode. You're expected to cycle between these three as the situation demands. Fighter Mode allows you to get around quicker, Gerwalk is best for strafing enemies with missiles, and Batroid is for close encounters with the machine gun. This is the only mode that has a lock-on that changes your movement. Later Macross games streamlined the switching a bit and made it much smoother, but what we have here works well enough once you get used to it. The first thing you'll want to do upon starting a new game is switching the flight mode from the default easy to normal. Easy tries to keep you parallel to the ground and you'll be fighting with it every step of the way as you try and dogfight. I've seen it implemented quite well in other flight games, but here it just makes the game nigh unplayable. You should also disable the auto camera, which is also on by default. It gives you these cool cinematic angles on your kills, kind of like the Sniper Elite kill cams. But good luck playing the game for any length of time with these things always turned on. As complicated as the controls can be, they're only that way to emulate how the variable fighters move in the anime. The gameplay itself just tends to boil down to hitting enemies with the old Itano Circus, with the occasional boss fight that has you fighting a bit more strategically. There's an evasive roll that allows you to dodge missiles, but I often ended up using it by accident, and sometimes when I really needed to use it, it failed me. I would have liked this to be mapped to an actual button rather than a flick of the analog stick. The aesthetics of this game are very pleasing. I find it graphically superior to the western-made Robotech Battlecry on the same system. And they say cel-shaded graphics age more gracefully. It's a very short experience, however, with only 20 missions across two campaigns that can be beaten in a few hours. It's also very easy. I only game over out of confusion a couple times. You're able to replay missions with different variable fighters in the free play mode just in case you feel like going for all S ranks and unlocking everything. Unfortunately though, the variable fighter you see in these beautiful takeoff sequences may not be the one you picked on the selection screen. It's a good Macross game, but I won't call it my favourite one. That still remains Macross Delta Scramble on the PS Vita. The gameplay there is smoother and more refined. But this is obscure PS2 games, not obscure PS Vita games. Video game movie tie-ins aren't that uncommon. Well, they kind of are nowadays, but back in the PS2 era, they were pretty much everywhere. They mainly tied into contemporary blockbusters, though. 
And not all black and white movies like Akira Kurosawa's seminal 1954 classic Seven Samurai. It's about a village of farmers who, after being repeatedly pillaged by bandits, hire seven samurai to defend them. The story is timeless and has been reimagined in many different mediums over the years, so it isn't too surprising that there would eventually be a video game. It's Seven Samurai 20XX, or Seven Samurai 200XX, as the Spine of My Pal version erroneously claims. This version has it taking place in some kind of futuristic setting, with robots of unexplained origin and weird mutant people as the antagonists. Some sources online say that it borrows heavily from the anime Samurai 7, which is another adaptation with a sci-fi setting. I don't know how true that is, I haven't seen that anime in like over a decade, but I have my doubts considering this game predates it by half a year. Still, what was the obsession in 2004 with putting Seven Samurai in a diesel punk setting with robots? At the very least though, I do remember Samurai 7 following the story much closer than this game. This kind of just borrows the premise to do something completely different, almost always to its own detriment. The only recognisable character is Kanbei Shimada, who more or less fills the same function in this story as he did in the original movie, while the other six samurai are different characters entirely. They also don't do a whole lot to justify their presence in the story. You never even see this guy do anything, let alone wield a blade. The big guy doesn't use a sword at any point either, despite being a samurai. But at the very least, he looks like someone whose pint you wouldn't want to spill in the pub. It's at this point I must reveal the most perplexing aspect of this Seven Samurai game. You only play as one of the samurai, with the others just being part of the cutscenes. This is pure insanity to me, and feels completely at odds with its own premise. If I told you there was a Seven Samurai game, you would just automatically assume there's seven playable characters, right? That's such a no-brainer. Especially considering how it desperately needed something like that to break up its monotonous hack-and-slash gameplay, which is distinctly of the drunk salaryman variety. You control Naoto, a wisecracking swordsman and reluctant hero. You can pretty much just flail around the left stick while mashing square and he does cool things, like these killing blows and dashes. The manual and game itself tells us that you do these by approaching from the right angle, whatever that means. I played this entire game and I still couldn't tell you how they work. How did you do that? I don't know. Pressing the shoulder buttons activates Nito Ryu, which increases your attack speed and allows Naoto to use both of his swords. It's so powerful, you'd think it was some kind of super move that you have to earn, but the cooldown is so quick, you'll be in this mode more often than not, rendering the single sword fighting style kind of pointless. There's a guard button that works in a very unusual way. Once you press the button, any attack will be automatically blocked for a couple seconds afterwards. This makes guarding less reactive and more predictive in nature. Most encounters boil down to mashing the square button with the occasional triangle thrown in for automatic guarding. This ends up being for the best though, because combat is so frantic you'll never be able to pay attention to the enemy's attack patterns. There's often a lot going on on screen and the frame rate suffers because of it. An unforgivable sin in a fast and frenetic game like this. It makes it really hard to recommend even as a brainless hack and slash because you're constantly dealing with painful slowdown. Oh my god, I can't stand it! What you see here is all the game really has outside of its cutscenes. It's a very linear experience where you go from encounter to encounter with very little dilly-dallying in between. Except for Chapter 3, which is a bit of an anomaly where they tried something different. It's open-ended with lots of NPCs to talk to and ways to get lost. It brings the game's pacing grinding to a halt with all of its pointless meandering and random boss fights unrelated to anything. By the end, I was more than happy to get back to the linear corridors that make up the vast majority of the other chapters. I will say that most of the boss fights are funny and interesting, if a little short-lived and easy. Interesting because they're weird characters, not mechanically interesting. The rapping duo was not something I was expecting. As for the story, well, it's an odd version of Seven Samurai that I wasn't really into. It throws in a lot of twists and turns that overcomplicates the beautiful simplicity of the original story. Although I do really like Nato, 
Pretty much every line of dialogue from him is really good. Life is harsh, brothers. Okay, this is a bit of a tangent, but it annoyed the hell out of me. So in the original movie, they create this banner that represents the villagers and the Seven Samurai, with the triangle representing Kikuchiro, the lovable scamp who's not actually a samurai, played by Toshiro Mifune. In this game, the triangle represents Nato because he's the odd one out. Even though he really isn't out of place in this game's cast, Jodie is just as out of place if she is indeed counted among the seven, which none of the characters ever decide on. But never mind that, why are there seven samurai on this banner when the seventh is Q, a character who doesn't even appear, much less join their cause, until the next chapter? It's like they put this in here because it was in the original movie, even though it doesn't make any sense. Q in general feels like a character they threw into the game last minute. She comes out of nowhere, and her whole story feels so far removed from the main plot. It's all in service of this generic villain they introduce towards the end who wants to take over the world, or something like that. You'd think the other samurai would show up to help Nato here, but they don't. It's like he got bored of being seven samurai and decided to be something else instead. It's debatable how interested it was in being a seven samurai game to begin with, though. Curiously, there's an English dub, even though the original Japanese release already had perfectly serviceable English voice acting. Okay, guys, get out of here as fast as you can. Those are humanoids. They're kind of nasty. You better move fast. Come on, Hinata. There was quite a bit of talent working on this game. The opening and ending themes were done by legendary composer Ryuichi Sakamoto of YMO fame. The characters were designed by the prolific Mobius. I have Moebius who was a genius. Moebius was a genius. It should have been a great game, but it just ended up being mediocre overall, which is a real shame. I wonder why. Oh, that explains it. It's always a shame when a series is missing entries. This is the case with Career Soft's Grow Lancer on PS1 and most of the games in the series it's a spiritual successor to, Langrisser. These games were known for offering content-rich adventures with branching pathways filled with missable secrets. They also featured the gorgeous artwork of the Master of Breasts himself, Satoshi Arushihara, who is definitely up there as one of my favourite character designers. His sparkly elaborate costumes, the oversized pauldrons, the beautiful women and androgynous men. It's the only fantasy aesthetic I have ever truly vibed with. The masculine urge to dress like an Urushihara character. Grow Lancer 2 and 3 were combined into one package when they were brought over to the US by Working Designs, called Grow Lancer Generations. Not to be confused with Grow Lancer 5 Generations. We're only going to be focusing on the second installment in this segment, however. It's the one that suffers the most from the first game never being localized, sadly since its story takes place sometime during the events of that one and features a lot of the same characters. It has its own cast and self-contained story for the most part though, so it's not like you'll be confused or anything. But some of the fan service moments will be over your head. Let the main character from the first game joining your party. It's a strategy RPG with a rather unique battle system. You select your character's actions and then the battle plays out in real time only stopping when they have no actions left to take, or you press square. There's a lot of emphasis on movement and positioning to complete most objectives. Selecting attack on an enemy will make the character move until they're in range automatically, or you can move them yourself by drawing them a path. I would recommend doing the latter, because leaving it up to the game can lead to disastrous consequences. Characters get stuck on each other, or the environment, and waste precious time being indecisive about what to do next. And buffs that speed you up and reduces the wait time and actions are actually incredibly useful in this game, particularly in missions where you're on a time limit. Sometimes you might need to kill all the enemies before they escape, or before they kill a character you need to protect. That kind of thing. One really annoying mission has the floorboards collapsing behind you. Now, fortunately, most of the time, it's not game over if you fail some of these objectives. You'll just get a mission over instead of a mission complete. Which is the same thing, unless you're going for the secret route. I think the most annoying part about the battle system is that you don't know how long certain actions will take. When will my character be able to attack again? When can they move? How long will this spell take to cast, etc? 
There are these bars in the menu that I think are meant to convey this information, but I have no idea how. Maybe when the bar is full, but I swear I've never seen these bars fill all the way. Time is hard to account for, since it's constantly being paused by the menus, and it's not like you can see how many turns have passed or whatever. It's kind of hard to strategize when you don't know any of these things. I like certainty and precision in my battle system, and this game just doesn't offer that. I also think spellcasters are way too niche in their utility. Most enemies take pitiful damage from magic, to a point where it's much harder to level them up because of it. Yeah, characters only get XP when they do stuff. Fortunately, that includes healing, so this is what most of your spellcasters are doing 90% of the time. It sounds like I hate the gameplay, but that's not really the case. It's actually really satisfying when you figure out the right approach to missions. I really enjoyed tinkering with the gems and rings outside of battle as well. It feels like there's a lot of ways of making yourself overpowered without actually breaking the game, which takes some good balance to accomplish. Throughout the game, you'll run into characters that will join your party. Typical RPG stuff. At some point, I was expecting to bench some of these characters to make room for the new ones, but this never happens. Every party member is usable in battle at the same time, so you have quite the army by the end. The amount of enemies you face scales accordingly. Some party members, you'll have to look up a guide on how to recruit though. Arietta is being possessed and will only join your party if you manage to free her. Will you destroy this innocent girl's body? Which is to say, if you make the right decisions in the right places. If you fail though, you do get a different party member instead. It's a game that's meant to be played more than once. I was following a guide, and still somehow managed to miss a bunch of stuff. As I said, this series is known for its branching pathways. Towards the end, I thought it would be funny to betray my friends and join the villain's side, and sure enough, that scenario plays out. It's one thing to be told that a villain's ideology is bad, it's another to see it in practice with your own eyes. There's also a bit of a dating sim aspect that's influenced by your dialogue choices and who you spend time with. I ended up with Riviera, but it's possible to piss everyone off and be left with just your buddy Hans. Fine with me, because Hans is a total bro. One of the best friend characters in all of JRPG history. Especially with the dumb stuff the working designs localization has him saying. Say hola to my spicy little friends, Bendejo! The English voice acting is pretty bad for the most part though, and sounds like it was recorded on subpar equipment. I imagine it's better to download an undub patch nowadays. Definitely worth checking out if you like what you see. These accessories are perfectly suited to complement your radiant beauty <coughs> and double bosom. At first glance, Sub Rebellion appears to be just an unassuming bargain bin game. It has a generic title, and the cover art doesn't inspire much confidence. Aside from the sick logo design, the Japanese version isn't much better. This is probably the main reason it's relatively obscure and found its way into this video, because it certainly isn't because of the game itself. Sub Rebellion is shockingly good, and deserves to be a cult classic. If there isn't a cult around this game already, I'm starting one. We can call ourselves the Submariners. Or is it pronounced Submariners? Anyway, I'm not too familiar with the submarine genre. As far as I can tell, it hasn't enjoyed nearly as much success or coverage as the flight genre. And just like the flight genre, most of the games seem geared more towards hardcore players. Very dense and meant to emulate the real-world operations of actual submarine warfare. Sub Rebellion, on the other hand, leans heavily into arcadey action. It's essentially the ace combat of submarine games, complete with a bonkers setting that's fueled more by what the developers thought was cool rather than realistic. It takes place in a post-apocalyptic future where the shifting of the Earth's crust has submerged two-thirds of the Earth's landmasses, and driven humanity into the ocean. The old world was left in crumbles, and in its wake rose a powerful corporate empire that seized control using the new dominant weapons of war, the submarine. 
the Allied forces were formed in an attempt to challenge their authoritarian rule. And that's the side we find ourselves working for as mercenaries operating a super-advanced new sub, the Kronos. It's considerably faster than most of the vessels you'll find yourself up against, and you're expected to take full advantage of this to carry out your underwater operations. The default control scheme is pretty easy to pick up and play, while also being complicated enough to have a bit of a learning curve to it, particularly if you're not used to games with both horizontal and vertical movement. Forward movement, as well as diving and ascending, are your main means of avoiding enemy fire. Doing both at the same time is even better. Like I said, it's all very arcadey and approachable. You have infinite ammo and don't even take damage when you collide against a wall. The Kronos will start taking damage at depths below 140 meters though, but you can't even descend that low in a good chunk of the missions. You fire your guns by tapping the square button and lock on with torpedoes by holding it down. Torpedoes are most effective at a longer range, and their tracking ability increases the more of them you fire at once, which is a really clever way of going about it. It's rewarding you for putting yourself in harm's way for a longer period of time. Your torpedoes may be unlimited, but you still have to wait for them to reload, so your strategy in most encounters should be hit and run. It runs on that ace combat dynamic of alternating between attack and defend. You should be moving at all times. Ideally, you should be moving even while locking on torpedoes, unless you're locking on while hiding behind cover, which is a legitimate strategy. It's a simple formula used to great effect for the large variety of mission objectives it throws at you. These are revealed to you during the mission briefings, but they almost never tell the full story. There's always some unexpected change in plans, such as the arrival of a really hard boss, so the only way you can properly prepare yourself is by playing the mission and finding out. And yeah, you'll sometimes need to bring the correct loadout. There was a mission later on that may have been impossible with my short-ranged wide cannon. How was I supposed to know? I know I keep bringing up Ace Combat, but this aspect is also similar to those games, as anyone who has ever brought the A-10 into a secret air-to-air -air mission can attest. It's annoying, yes, but it is justified since we only know as much as the characters do. And that surprise is more fun. Some missions require you to surface the Kronos to attack gun emplacements and aircraft. This is probably my least favourite part of the gameplay. A surfaced submarine is a vulnerable submarine, after all. It's so much harder to avoid taking damage this way. The transition from underwater in the surface isn't as smooth as it could be, and you'll find yourself taking a lot of cheap shots from things you'd have no way of knowing was there. Nevertheless, they act as a nice breather from the underwater stuff, no pun intended. Make no mistake, every kind of hard mission objective a game can possibly have is present here. Super hard boss fights with no checkpoints? Check. Defending stationary targets? Check. Escort mission? You know it. It can be pretty brutal. The pacing of the story mode is good enough that there's always a breather mission after a really tough one, but it can feel like a brick wall at times. The difficulty ramps up as early as mission 6 when you have to destroy this massive flagship. This is the game's skill check to make sure you've been paying attention to the mechanics. It's deciding whether you're persistent enough to continue on to Mission 7, or walking away in shame. My advice is to never move behind this thing and prepare to hit the front when it opens up. Another strategy is to drop some mines in front of it. This is a special weapon that you can purchase from the game's shop. It's the only type of weapon that has limited ammo. Later on, you can purchase a small nuclear warhead that you will almost certainly put to waste. It has a big explosion, obviously, but it somehow missed every time I used it. Skill issue, I know. The missions I hate in this game are the ones where you have to defend things. It always feels a bit unfair and down to RNG. I should mention that if you're struggling, grinding for better parts is always an option. I recommend taking this route through mission 5 and collecting all the treasure along the way. You can get upwards of 80k every 5 minutes. The rarity of the treasure is random though, so sometimes it could be less and sometimes it could be more. The greatest benefits comes from upgrading your weapons and shield. Engine upgrades aren't nearly as useful as you'd think. 
going forwards, a sub will always reach 43.1 knots, or a bit higher if ascending or descending at the same time. This does not change from the starter engine up to the best one you can acquire. So what do they actually do then? This one says it increases your maneuverability, and maybe it does, but it feels pretty much the same to me. The only difference I noticed is that your backward speed is increased from 21.5 knots to 26.9. This will come in slightly useful in places, but it's hardly worth the amount of cash you have to pay for it. You have something called Exonar, which you activate by tapping the X button, of course. It temporarily reveals a wireframe layout of any enemies, treasure and objectives that might be close by. At first, I was a little annoyed that you have to keep pressing this button, it's not an automatic thing. It's so useful you'll be pinging it every few seconds. However, after a while I started to appreciate this aspect. Somehow it's just more immersive that way, it's hard to explain. You want to keep your eyes peeled for any health items. The game is kind of stingy about giving them to you depending on the mission. Sometimes they're plentiful, sometimes they're entirely absent, like the final mission. I wouldn't mind so much, except this mission has a part where you're forced to take damage. You have to descend below 140 meters and then fight not one, but two boss fights afterwards. All without any health pickups. It's pretty hardcore, I can kind of respect it. Something I haven't touched on is the treasure hunting aspect and the understated sense of adventure this game has. It reminded me a bit of Sky Odyssey from the last obscure PS2 games video. There's even a mission where you have to collect all the pieces of a map. I said this was underwater race combat, but it doesn't really have the same kind of storytelling. Radio chatter is sparse and limited to text mostly. Characters are non-existent. The only thing approaching one is the rival Hammerhead sub that we have multiple encounters with. It doesn't linger on any of the politics of the setting either. In fact, it feels less interested in its post-apocalyptic future and more in the past that was revealed because of it. Our underwater treasure hunting eventually reveals the remnants of a highly advanced lost civilization, known as the Prometheans. Both sides are trying to get a hold of their technology, angering the ancient superweapons that were placed there to protect them. These are the Guardians, and the boss fights you have against these guys are my favourite parts of the game. Yeah, you probably wasn't expecting this submarine game to have giant mechas in it, but here we are. The final mission takes us to the Promethea Holy Ground, where the reason behind their departure is revealed to us by these tablets. They were aliens who left Earth long ago and submerged their technology so they couldn't be exploited by man. Their name clearly derives from Prometheus, which implies that they were partially responsible for humanity's technological advancements in the first place. The implication is that man's drive to war will ultimately lead them to annihilation lest they're able to cast aside petty squabbles. Clearly, the developers were huge fans of Nadia, The Secret of Blue Water, which has some similar themes and is also about a really cool submarine. Oh hey, the nuke finally came in useful. I really love this game. There's nothing else like it. It all just comes together to create a wonderful ballet of tense underwater combat that will have you on the edge of your seat. It's the gaming equivalent of DOS Boot, it's considered to be a spiritual successor to Irem's earlier game, In the Hunt. It didn't get nearly as much love as that game, though. It's probably easier to sell people on really good sprites nowadays than grimy PS2 visuals. I'm definitely more of a fan of the latter, though. The Japanese release had voice acting in places that was sadly not dubbed for the English version. This, in addition to the way the story is conveyed, gives it a bit of a cheap feel that undersells the game. The community around this game is non-existent, so there's barely any guys that will tell you how to unlock stuff. An unfortunate side effect of this being an obscure, yet great PS2 game. A special thank you to my channel members and patrons. I do record this every time, you know, I'm not just reusing audio. 
Anyway, I've been Snickety Slice, I'll see you around.